today. I mean, every week's exciting. Duh. It is Wednesday. It is September 11th. All right. All right. I'm still letting some folks in and then I will hand it over. We've got a great one today. As you guys know, it's Wednesday, Nonprofit Plug Lunch and Learn. I'm Dr. Sharon, CEO of the Nonprofit Plug. We have a guest speaker today, Miss Maria Chapman. She is the founder of Connected Ghostwriting, and they specialize in helping nonprofit founders and thought leaders craft impactful content that amplifies their mission, aka unlocking the donor dollars, because that's really what we want to get to these days. So we've got Maria with us here today. She's got a great understanding of how to communicate complex ideas. She works with empowering organizations to articulate their values and goals, driving engagement, fostering meaningful connections. She's been recognized by Martha Vineyard's Institute of Creative Writing. Holy cow, Maria, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and they highlighted her commitment to using words as powerful tool for change. And unlocking donor dollars, which is, of course, everything that we want in our lives today. We're going to be real. Talk about money. We're going to be real. Um, before we dive in, do does anybody have any wins, accomplishments, milestones that they'd like to share with us today? Maurice, I know you got something to share because something's coming up. <laughs> How's it going? Hi, how yes, are you? Me, Remind yes, tell us your, tell, be sure to tell us your name, your nonprofit, and then... And then tell us about the event coming up. Uh, so Maurice Youthway, we on watch. We have, well, me and Erica and everyone. Where's Erica at? It's on here <laughs> so somewhere. We have, <laughs> so we have a uh, box clinic on the 28th of this month. Um, it's from one to three, and it's just training. We have a professional boxer come and help, or actually I should say help, help train the community how to box correctly. And... Um, it's all ages, so come down, support. We're going to have some drinks, water, snacks, that is, and um, have a good time. Awesome. Thanks, Marie. So that's September 28th. If any of you guys are Cal uh, Southern California, Los Angeles-based nonprofits, this is a free event for youth and families to come learn some uh, boxing, boxing skill sets. Thanks, Maurice. Anybody uh -huh. else have any wins, accomplishments that they want to share? If not, we're going to dive right into today's content, Unlocking Donor Dollars. Maria, the floor is yours. Oh, I love those words. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Maria Chapman. I am the owner of Connected Ghostwriting. My assistant, Letitia, is here with us today. She's going to help us with any questions and things like that that we have. So Letitia, do you want to say hi to everybody quickly? All right. It looks like she's saying hi in the chat. That must mean a kid is home. <laughs> All right, so I am here today to talk to you about unlocking donor dollars and using content to do that. So I'm gonna share my screen so you guys can see this. Let's see, there we are. All right, there we are. So at, let's see. There we go. All right. So at Connected Ghostwriting, we say that we write words that change the world. And we specialize in working with mental health, wellness, and social justice thought leaders. Um, in my previous life, I was a curriculum development expert, and I have lots of years of education experience. Um, I have a nonprofit, Journeys to Success, launching uh, November 1st is our start date. We have some funding rolling in, and we're, we're launching November 1st, so we're excited about that. Uh, our agency has helped nonprofits use content creation to unlock donor dollars. We have written books for nonprofits, websites, blogs, email marketing materials, all other kinds of marketing materials as well. Um, because when you are trying to unlock donor dollars, you are marketing just like any business owner is marketing when they're trying to make a sale. Um, and then there's some personal details at the bottom there. I'm a parent of five and a lover of all the words. So today is focused on content creation for unlocking those donor dollars. This can be used with writing books, websites, blogs, email marketing, social media content, wherever you're putting content, you can use this. And this works whether you're doing written content, video content, you even need this if you're using AI to generate content, because if you're using 
I'm a writer, but I'm not afraid to talk about AI because it's real and it's here and it's staying. So if you're using AI, you still need these lessons in order to use AI effectively to meet your donors where they are. Okay. So whatever way you're creating content, this is going to help you today. So we're going to launch, I'm going to dive right in. We are building donor avatars. And I looked and looked and looked for a better word than avatar. We could say persona. None of those are very exciting words and I apologize. Uh, but really what we need are detailed profiles of the different donors you have. And most of you probably have or want to have donors that are individuals and donors that are corporations and foundations, right? So um, we have a nonprofit we work with that works with multiracial youth and they have a foundation that gave them a very large donation. And then they've been able to go back to that foundation a few more times for a few different initiatives for more funds. But they're also pulling in dollars from individual donors who like their mission and want to support them. So they have two different audiences that they're looking at. And that's why we want to create those donor avatars. Because when a nonprofit segments their marketing campaigns, so it says digital campaigns there, but we're talking about marketing. Nonprofits are businesses. Businesses need to market. So when you segment as a nonprofit and target different donor donor personas, donor avatars, you will see a huge leap in the donor dollars you're bringing in. All right. So before we move on, I just want to know, you can drop it in the chat if you'd like, if you have already identified your different types of donors and you have some idea of who they are, let me know in the chat who you are reaching out to as your donors. Are they individuals? Are they corporations? Are you looking for foundations? Are you looking for grants? Are you looking at people who love animals? Are you looking for people who wanna help kids? Are you looking for companies that are involved in tech? Let me know who you're looking for. Okay, I see corporations. I see corporations, individuals, and foundations, arts and community-based donors. That's awesome. We've got some more people looking at corporations. Okay, and I know for, for a lot of states, um, they want nonprofit dollars coming from both individuals and corporations. They don't want anyone relying too heavily on just corporate donations. So that's something that you might wanna look into. We've got banks, education, art, entertainment, and tech industry donations. I love it. Educational underprivileged youth grants and donations, corporations, foundations, mediators, and attorneys. Excellent. I love how specific you guys are getting. Foundations providing grants for housing and leadership development, tech education, and foster youth. Okay. So let's get into how we create these donor avatars. We start with demographics, but we we really kind of gloss over it. Demographics help us with um, what social media they're using, how they're con consuming content. Are they on LinkedIn? Are they someone who's going to read an article on Medium? Are they someone who's going to scroll on TikTok? Um, so we want to spend some time on demographics, but we're going to quickly move on. So for demographics, we're talking age, income level, location, profession. Uh, we are talking education level. If we are talking about a corporation, what sort of revenue is the corporation that you're going to target bringing in? Are you targeting small businesses that have 500K in revenue? Are you targeting 1 million revenue businesses? Are you targeting Fortune 500 companies? It's important to know that because how you talk to them needs to be different. Uh, where are these places located? If it's a person, we can talk profession, um, but if it's a corporation, what sort of corporation? So some of you said that you're looking for specifically, I see education, art, and entertainment industry corporations. We That's how specific we wanna get there when we're talking about demographics as it relates to corporations, okay? And then we move beyond demographics for each category you identify. 
So I have two examples here. This is from a non the nonprofit I mentioned before that does multiracial affinity groups. Um, we've written a book, a website, and a bunch of blog content, email marketing content for them. So that's why I'm using them as my example here. Um, so for each donor group you identify for your nonprofit, you're gonna wanna break down the demographics and then jump into psychographics. So one of the things I'm, I'm gonna give you at the end of this is our ideal donor avatar worksheet. And so I know um, there's a recording here. Once you get that, you may wanna come back and review this as you're filling it out. What I do want to encourage you to do is fill out a different ideal donor persona avatar for each of those donor groups, okay? So moving back here, if we have donor group one and two, we're filling out two. If I have four donor groups, um, let's see, I'm seeing Miss Bennett is looking for banks, education, art, entertainment, and tech industry corporations. That's a lot of ideal donor avatars, but don't shy away from doing the work of really figuring out how to talk to each one because then you can make sure your content does that, okay? All right, so psychographics are interests, values, and the causes they support, but it also encompasses the motivations people have for giving and how they communicate. So if we have someone who is really interested in animals, we have a nice cat here, right? If we have someone who's really interested in animals and they value taking care of animals, they are probably someone who's likely to donate to PETA if they can do that, okay? And this would be for an individual, but for a corporation, we can look at their mission and vision statements to garner their values, what kind of causes they might support. For foundations and, don't, and other organizations that donate, regularly to nonprofits, they will have a thesis statement that says what sorts of nonprofits they donate to. So when you're looking, let's see, we're gonna pick someone else here. So if we have, Stacy is looking for attorneys and mediators, okay? So when we are looking at law firms, what are they interested in from a give back to the community standpoint? They wanna look good right? Yes, they want to give back, but they they are selfish in some ways too, and they want to look good. So we need to make sure that we target our marketing campaigns, this content that we're creating to do that. Okay. Um, that goes into their motivations for giving too. Um, Shirley, who is a retired school teacher who has some money to donate, is going to donate very differently than the owner of that Fortune 500 company that has a grant available for an education outreach program, right? They have different giving motivations. So you need to be able to tap into that. And we'll talk about how to do that. And then you need to look at their preferred communication channels, okay? Surely retired school teacher consumes content differently than Fortune 500 C-suite executive. And they're looking for places to send their money in different ways. <clears throat> All right. So then after we've done that, we want to talk about their giving behavior. How much, what type, and how often? So Shirley might be someone who donates when she feels an emotional pull. It's irregular. And she donates small amounts. Maybe she gives $5, $10, $25. Okay. And our C-suite executive, he's giving much larger amounts. Is it a one, one time a year thing? Um, community banks are really great places to look for this. Um, so if you have local community banks where your nonprofit runs, they have grants available. They typically give them out every year. You typically have to get an application in by a certain date. You typically have to send the application to a certain person. Figure out who that person is. Figure out what that date is and get all of this in your ideal donor avatar worksheet, which you can then create a spreadsheet of all those different ideal donors 
so that you know when to reach out, how much to ask for, and who to talk to. And then for nonprofits, um, who was it that shared about the event you're running this weekend in Rot in Watts? Is that Maurice? That was Maurice. All right. So we're going to talk about Maurice now. So Maurice, you might have people who can't give financially, but really want to help out. And so they're giving in time and energy, right? And we want to think of those volunteers as donors, because in life, we really just have time, energy, and money. And if we can't give one and we want to give the other, we are still a donor, right? So Maurice, you're thinking about all those volunteers that are going to show up and help you put on an amazing event, just like you're thinking about someone who's going to give you money. All right. Now we're talking about emotional triggers. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you hear the song playing when you look at this picture of Sarah McLaughlin. How many of you hear that song playing? All right. The reason you remember it is because they took their ideal donor avatar and they put the images they needed to communicate right directly to the heart of those people. Letitia's saying she hates those commercials. I know Letitia, I know it's because they probably make her cry. Um, I think she's adopted two dogs since I've known her. Oh, there's Merrick, yep. Okay, so we can remember that marketing from that nonprofit because of how effective it was at targeting their ideal donors. Okay, so think about the challenges your donor cares about. If you're pitching attorneys who work in family law, they're going to care about different things than attorneys who work in corporate litigation. Okay, if you are pitching, um, let's see, we've got someone looking for housing, leadership development, and tech education for foster youth. Okay. If we're looking for donors who care about the challenges of those groups, we need to figure out what emotions drive their giving. Okay. So if we have someone, my nonprofit is serving the disability community. Now I'm serving the disability community because I'm someone who identifies as disabled. I have a neuromuscular condition and that's a cause that's near and dear to my heart. I'm gonna donate differently than someone who is helping the homeless. We worked with a nonprofit once who was helping to house homeless folks in the LGBTQ community in Georgia. And in Georgia, all of the homeless shelters aged out, you aged out of at 25 for the LGBTQ homeless shelters. And so they were making a shelter for people a little bit older than that. The donors they were looking for might be people who are in the LGBTQ community, who have the means to donate. That might be one of their ideal donor avatars. So we need to tap into what people feel that makes them give, okay? And then we need to identify impact stories that resonate. And I know all of you started a nonprofit for a reason. And that reason can be one of your stories, but it shouldn't be your only story. We need case studies. We need, hey, we put on this event where we had people in the community come and learn about boxing. And here's what happened after that event. Okay. We need those stories. And so as the nonprofit founder, as the nonprofit director, one of your tasks is to collect those stories. And there are a few different ways to do this. Um, I have a spreadsheet where I jot down, I'm like, oh, I need to write a blog about this. I need to do this. I need to write a blog about this. I need to write an article about this. I need to write a book about this. And I have this spreadsheet, it's a Google Doc, it's on my phone, it's on my computer. So when I wake up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and I think, oh my gosh, I need a blog article about blah, blah, blah. 
or I need to write a case study about this. I jot it down and then I can go back to sleep because otherwise my brain's going to keep trying to write the story all night long and I won't get any sleep. So that's one of your responsibilities as a nonprofit founder or director is to collect those impact stories that will resonate with your donors. And then we align those donor personas with the challenges and emotions that help that trigger donation behavior and line that up with the stories that we've collected. <clears throat> All right, so this is just literal data from a study on donation behavior of corporations and individuals. I linked the study there. So those of you who are curious, once you get this recording and I'll send the slideshow as well, you can take a look at that on your own. Um, I'm not gonna insult you by reading this whole slide to you. But the what I wanna point out here is that the reason we segment Seg the reason we segment our donor populations is because we have different motivations, we have different triggers, and we want something different out of our donations, okay? And in the business world, we would call this ROI, right? Everybody wants a different return on investment. A donation is an investment. Now, we're not trying to get interest back on that investment. We're not hoping to receive more money as a re direct result of that investment. Um, but for individual donors, there are psychological benefits to donation. People feel good when they help out a cause that is near and dear to their hearts. Corporations don't feel good about that. Corp uh, the, the owners might, but the corporation itself doesn't have feelings. What a corporation wants is to look good to their community, to look good to their stakeholders, to look good to their constituents. And so we need to speak to that in our content when we're talking to those corporate donors. All right. So I'm going to click this. We're not going to take the time to read through it, but it's here because I wanted you to have an example to look at if you're going through this on your own. So these are, oops, hold on. Let's see. Click the link, there we go. So this will take you to a document that has an appeal to individual donors and an appeal to corporations that we wrote for one of our clients. And I went in and I bolded words that I just wanted to point out to you that are specifically talking to ROI, okay? So this person is an individual donor and we're talking about the importance of nurturing the next generation. But then when we go to corporations, we are highlighting their commitment to diversity and social impact, their investment in the future, alignment with their brand, enhancing the reputation, benefits to your stakeholders. We are talking differently to the corporations than we are to the individuals. Um, and so those examples are in there. You can take a look at them. <clears throat> but again, we're just trying to show the difference in the way we talk to the different donors once we segment them. <clears throat> Just going back here for a moment, there was something, nope, my brain went. There was something I said, oh, that might be helpful. It'll come back to me or it won't. All right, so how do we plan our content? Once we have these ideal donor avatars, the first thing we're gonna do is set clear goals. What do we want our content to do? Now, these goals might be, we wanna reach this many people on social media. That's a goal. We want to have 15 people click the link on our email marketing campaign that we send out. We want $100,000 in new donations within six months. So your goals could be an engagement goal. Your goal could be a, a, a money goal. And your goal could be a reach goal. Okay. And by reach, I mean how many people know you exist. The goals you set will guide your strategy so that every single piece of content you create serves a purpose, okay? Then you're going to choose formats and you are going to need different formats for your different donor, pers donor personas. There's a lot of vowels in that. So for your corporate, buyers, your cor corporate donors, they're probably not reading your blog posts. 
But if you are posting blogs on your website, Google knows your website exists. And when the corporate donation department or the corporate funding department is looking for nonprofits in the education sector that are located in southeastern Los Angeles, they need to be able to find you. And that's where blogs can come in. We're going to talk about that in a minute when we get to talking about SEO, which I'm just going to touch on briefly because I know Dr. Sharon has someone coming soon to talk to you in depth about SEO, who is an amazing expert in it. So I'm not going to pretend I'm the expert there. Um, so we need different formats. Um, some of your donors are going to be people who consume content on social media. Some are not. Some are going to be consuming content on LinkedIn. Some are going to be YouTube scrollers. Yes, Stephen, I'm talking about you. She's talking, he's talking in the chat. <laughs> and then we're going to create a content calendar. Um, so your content calendar is where you're organizing and planning your content over time. And this allows you to plan out in the future. And what you're looking for is lining up with key dates. So for example, if you're a nonprofit that serves the LGBTQ community and you don't have some special content for the month of June, then you slept on that month, right? June is Pride Month. We've got to maximize that. If you are a an education related nonprofit, let's say you run after school programs. I want to see a big content push in August. It's back to school time. The kids are coming back, right? I have a, a, a client who runs a backpack food program in New ha in the New Haven, Connecticut area. And they need to be hitting those donations at back to school time when people are thinking about the kids heading back to school, okay? And so if we get all of that in a calendar ahead of time, our workflow just, it's a lot, it's a lot easier. Um, all right. And then the next part we talked about was that we have to pick stories, those impact stories that you're collecting as you're not a nonprofit founder director. We already said, it's your job to collect the stories. And so then how do we line these up? So we're looking for stories that leverage all of the greatness that your organization is doing in the world. We want stories that resonate with donors. I have a client who runs a educational advocacy nonprofit and she didn't have any stories from clients when she first started because she hadn't had any clients yet. And so what she did is she told her story of going through school as someone who had some neurodivergence and didn't have an advocate. And then she told the story of helping her young daughters get the services they needed in school and how that spurred her into creating this nonprofit for advocacy. So even if you haven't launched yet, even if you don't have clients yet, you still have a story. Sometimes you need some help figuring out what that story is and getting it pulled out of you. Um, and that's where a coach or someone to, to chat with who's doing similar work can be helpful. And then we're going to do emotional appeals, okay? So we are looking to spark empathy, maybe some urgency, like with the example of the education nonprofits, that back to school time, there is a sense of urgency. These kids are coming back to school. They're gonna go home after school with nothing to do and they're watching TV. Instead, they can go to our great after school program and experience all these wonderful things, right? And so we can hit that urgency in August which feels different to a donor than talking about after school programs in April when everyone is thinking about summer vacation. And then we want to incorporate some data. Now, I don't ever want to throw a pile of data at people, right? We had we had two instances of data in this entire presentation so far and I'm referencing them and then moving on. But your donors, particularly your corporate donors, want to see data on how what you do is helping the population you serve, right? Because that data helps 
bolster their confidence in that ROI and appealing to their stakeholders. All right. Search engine optimization, and Stephen's going to spark up in the chat again. Stephen is a search engine optimization expert who's going to be talking to the nonprofit plug community in a couple of weeks. Um, and he is my favorite search engine optimization expert. Search engine optimization just means making it easy for people to find you. Okay. And it's using targeted keywords to improve your visibility. So this is, as I said, if I'm a corporation and I have some money and I want to donate it, and I want to donate it to someone in the education sector in the community I serve. Um, I know the community bank near me literally does this. They look for nonprofits serving their local community to donate to. And so if you are using search engine optimization effectively, it will be much easier for those people to find you. Now, search engine optimization can also help on social media because the social media algorithms are scanning your um, captions on your posts for keywords so that when people type in, you know, they're searching for animal videos, the Sarah McLaughlin video might come up. Probably not anymore. That what was that from the 90s? How old? How old am I? All right. So yeah, Stephen just put in the chat, SEO is the steps you take to make it easier for people to find you. And what we want to do there is get inside the donor's head and think about what they are searching for on social media, what they are searching for on Google. Um, and I think the the data is showing right now that people my age and older um, are still using Google as a search engine, but the younger audiences are primarily using social media as a search engine. So if they want to find um, services, they are typically looking on social media first. <clears throat> and then we want effective calls to action. So if the Sarah McLaughlin video with all the puppies that didn't have homes had played and never asked for a donation, they still would have impacted people's emotions. They still would have had Letitia crying on their couch, right? and they would have gotten no donations. You will not get donations if you don't ask for donations. And so as business owners, as nonprofit founders, you have to get good at asking for money, okay? And in order to do that, my biggest piece of advice is to really believe in what you're doing. Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, that'll come across in your pitch, whether it's written, whether it's video, whether it's live. And if you don't believe in it, your donors aren't going to either. So that's my number one piece of advice. My number two piece of advice is if you're talking content, don't ask for donations in every piece of content. Uh, for businesses, a rule of thumb is 90% of your content should not be directly asking for people to spend money on your business. Um, nonprofits, you can creep up a little bit. You can, instead of 10% of your content asking for donations, you can go 15, 20, experiment with it a little bit and see what works. Okay. Now a call to action is not always about donating. A call to action could be about engaging further. So our friend Maurice, who is running this amazing event, I imagine he has some volunteers. The only way you can find volunteers is if you ask for them. So if you need volunteers, don't be afraid to ask for them. And that can be another call to action that you use as well. And then we want to test and refine. So um, my team was actually talking about this yesterday. And today we tried a couple of things on social media. We looked at the numbers. We said, well, this worked really well. This didn't work really well. This got a lot of engagement. This didn't. And now we're refining based on the analytics, based on the data that we got. You want to do that in a nonprofit sector too. So if you decide based on your donor avatars and where they're hanging out, that you are going to be using LinkedIn, YouTube, and blogs on your website, and you're hitting SEO on blogs, you're hitting search engine optimization on YouTube as well, 
And then you're using a lot of those keywords as hashtags on social media and on LinkedIn. You want to see where you're getting most of your donor behavior from. And then double down on that spot. So if you try this for six months and you try those three different areas and you notice, you know what? I didn't have any donations coming in from the website. I had a pile of donations come in from contacts from you, from LinkedIn and YouTube got a lot of engagement, but only a couple donations. Then I want you to double down on LinkedIn, maybe add a little bit more on YouTube. Don't disappear from your website, but I wouldn't throw as much effort, time, and money behind it because it's not having the ROI for you that LinkedIn is having. Okay. So you want to test different areas and then you want to double down on what's working and give up what's not or refine what's not working. All right. Content management. I love having a content management system that can help house all of the contact information for your audience. So if you have someone who donated to you in 2019 and you don't have their email address, their phone number, their mailing address, how are you going to find them in 2020 and 2021, 2022? You as a nonprofit have ongoing needs. And so you need a way to stay connected with that audience. And email marketing is an amazing way to do that. Um, we love using Funnel Gorgeous for our content management in Funnel Gorgeous, we can schedule all our social media posts, schedule blog posts, and we can email our entire contact list as often as we want until we annoy them and they unsubscribe. Um, really try not to do that. Don't annoy people. But once someone has given you permission to email them because they've donated, because they've become part of your organization in some way, you wanna stay in contact with them. So find a way to do that. And there are lots of tools out there. Um, and that QR code, by the way, will take you to Funnel Gorgeous if you want to check it out. Find professionals to collaborate with. So as a nonprofit, um, you're, you're a business. So you need branding. You need graphic design. You need content design, whether that's social media, whether it's blogs, website. Um, you know, I have a couple nonprofit founders who have written books with us. So find people that can help you with what you need. And I know you are already doing that because you're part of the nonprofit plug. And so you are using all of Dr. Sharon's resources and all of the people in her little black book that are here to help nonprofits. So just make sure you keep that collaboration going. And the other thing you can do from a collaboration standpoint is um, bring in other people to guest on your social media, on your blog, okay? So if you have a nonprofit friend who's in an adjacent industry, bring them in as well. Make sure you're learning. You're all doing that already. You're here at the Nonprofit Plug. I know Dr. Sharon is launching the Nonprofit Plug University, um, and that's a great way to stay up on industry trends with the nonprofit world. But also, if you're serving the education industry, if you're serving the homeless community, make sure you're staying up to date with what's going on in those areas. All right. I'll invite you, if you have any questions and you want to raise your hand, we can do live questions. If you want to post a question in the chat, that's cool too. And then I will give you my contact information if you want to email me questions as well. All right, I don't see any questions. So let's head over to your resource. So I created the Ideal Donor Avatar Worksheet. These are the actual questions we use with nonprofits when we are designing a content plan for them. So I start this way. Oh, Danielle, I see your question. So I will get to it. What I start this way, whether I'm writing a book, a website, blogs, um, or any kind of marketing materials for a nonprofit, this is how we start. And again, we do this for each of their ideal donors. So if you'd like to download this, there's a QR code here. When you scan it, put in your email and you'll get an emailed copy of that. 
And Leticia, is that, did we make that a fillable PDF too so they don't have to print it? I think we did. All right, so Danielle asked, do we suggest we send different donors different emails? Absolutely. So this is one of the reasons, I'll go back to the QR code in a minute. This is one of the reasons I recommend a content management tool because Danielle, you can, in the content management tools, you can segment your audience. So you can tag some people as corporate donors, some people as individual donors, some people as volunteers. And your marketing email should be different for all of those populations, okay? Um, and it can be about the same topic, uh, but it should have a different call to action. It should have a different mention of ROI. Merrick, yes. Okay, so Merrick says, we often partner with local businesses to help promote our events. From your presentation, I'd count those as donations because our flyers are taking up space in their retail environment. And they're a small group of cyclists helping young people learn the basics of cycling. And they go to all of the local cycling shops in person. Yes. So one of the ways to give ROI to some of those corporate donors um, is, and, and like Merrick's saying for small businesses, is to offer them that advertising as a thank you for their donation. Okay. So um, let's see, I'm thinking of a corporation. All right, let's go with Nike. So if Nike donates to a sports team that is in an urban school district, and let's say they donate money, let's say they donate materials, that sports organization will put up a banner that says, thank you, Nike. You see this at Little League practice all the time, right? There's all the banners. We wanna thank our sponsors. If you can do that for corporations, that gives them ROI, it's advertising, and it gets them in front of the people they wanna talk to. All right, any other questions? All right, let's go back. All right, so here we have, that's the ideal donor worksheet. And then I also wanted to invite you. So sometimes, you know, I know nonprofits, a lot of you are bootstrapping at this point and it can be helpful once you have an ideal donor profile, like, okay, now what, right? So I wanted to offer each of you a donor strategy session. And this is something I normally do for businesses that we're writing for, and I do it for nonprofits as well. So what I'll do is I'll review your ideal donor persona worksheet. I'll answer questions you have, but you also get a content plan template. And I have an ebook called Reader First, which is a deeper dive into crafting content that focuses on your reader. And um, it's directed at people writing a book, but whether you're writing a book or a blog or an email, having that Reader First idea in mind can be very helpful. Um, so I am offering that to the nonprofit plug audience for $97. Um, normally just the session is $297 and then I'm throwing some extra bonuses in there. So this is not a timed offer. <laughs> you don't have to hurry up and, and, um, and do it now um, because I love the nonprofit community and I wouldn't do that to you guys. So if you would like to um, meet with me and go over your ideal donor avatars, I'm happy to do that. You can scan that QR code. And that QR code is also in the ideal avatar worksheet. Um, so if you don't get it here, you can scan that QR code in that document as well. Thank you, Maria. That was killer. I hope everyone on here today, the first thing y'all do is go ask a donor for some money and go identify who your ideal donor is. Come back and share it with us next week at the Lunch and Learn, because we want to hear about it. Every single person on here today should go ask at least, I'm going to even say five people between now and next Wednesday, 
ask five people for funds. Stacy, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> Stacy was taking notes. If you, yeah, if you don't ask for the money, the money doesn't come in. I love right? it. I mean, so. Yep. Close I, mouth, don't get fed. Right. I, so I've mentioned my, a couple of our nonprofits. I had a nonprofit that had um, had us craft a proposal for them for a foundation. Based on that pr proposal, they got a couple hundred thousand dollars for startup funds. And then a few months later, they wanted to write a book. So they went back to the foundation and said, I'd really like to write a book that goes along with my nonprofit and does this. Can you give me money so I can pay for book coaching? And they said, yes. And then they went back and said, oh, I really would like to self-publish this book and do some promotion around the book and market it. And the quotes I'm getting are somewhere between 50 and 25,000. And the foundation said, here's 30. So you have to go out and ask for the money. And knowing yep. who to ask and how to ask is the first. Yep. Step. That's one thing we talk about every single week, no matter what the topic is at Lunch and Learn. Michael and I are constantly like, Fix your pitch, your messaging. Let's get your mission vision right. Understanding your donor avatar is everything. This has been fantastic, Maria. I really appreciate you coming on, blessing us all with so much love. We are going to end a few minutes early today, you guys. Go get some food in your bellies. Go to the bathroom, get some water, go hydrate for that next meeting. As usual, this is recorded every single month. I appreciate you all. I'm sorry, recorded every single week. We will see y'all next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, right here on Zoom. This is the Nonprofit Prog Lunch and Learn. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you.